Today we're going to look at fact sheets, media advisories, media kits, and pitches. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on our fact sheets because that's what you'll be creating this week in class. We're going to talk about how that typically goes into this larger media kit, also referred to as a publicity toolkit. So as I said, publicity toolkit, media kit, those are used synonymously. And we're going to work toward that. We're going to start with one of the basic components that, um, that journalists and bloggers would expect to find in the publicity toolkit, and that is a fact sheet. So fact sheets are pretty easy. They tend to be one page, single, not single space, one page, uh, single sided, right? So it's not going to be two sided, two sides of a sheet of paper, just one. Uh, these tend to be very attractive, easy to read, quick to skim documents. That's why you'll see that sometimes there are outlines. A lot of times we're going to use bullets. They tend to be a very quick getting to know you piece. So if you picked up a fact sheet about Western Michigan University on that one page, it's going to look like Western. It's going to feel like Western. And very quickly, it's going to give the high points of what Western does, how it defines and positions itself, and what it offers. So there are three basic types of fact sheets. You have uh, one that you're going to do about a particular event or an exhibit, a company profile, and that's actually what I'm going to ask that each of you create this week. On the course client that you selected, you're just going to use this as a chance to get comfortable working with their look and feel and representing who they are. Uh, the third type of fact sheet can be a product specification sheet. So if we're thinking about the um, example of doing a Western company profile, if we wanted to go deeper, we could do a fact sheet that was more like a product specification sheet for each individual major or department. Right? Okay. Attractive fact sheet. This is about the Bay Bridge when they were uh, closing it two ways over a holiday weekend. And I'm going to walk you through some of the main points of the fact sheet. You see that the logo, right? Fact sheets need to immediately look and feel like the organization you're representing. One of the easiest ways to do that is to use our logo, use their colors and their fonts. Uh, the other thing, these fact sheets are always going to have a title. We need to be able to pick it up and immediately know what information is contained. What you'll see here is there are a number of subheads throughout this fact sheet. Uh, they're easy to access. They're in bright blue. They're in all caps. These would coincide with the text and the coloring of the Bay Bridge Seismic Safety Project. Uh, in this example, it's going to depend on who your organization is and what they look like in terms of the decisions you're making. But we use the subheads because we want people to get through this document very quickly. We don't want them feeling like they're reading a novel and some of these subheads might not pertain to us. So I might wanna know how I can plan ahead and why you selected the holiday weekend. In glancing at this, I can tell right away, right? You'll also notice that there are short sentences. We don't have a lot of space because you're gonna see that in addition to having the logo and the title, we are always going to have some sort of graphic and uh, some sort of call to action or contact information box or call out. So we need to make sure that this information is easily accessible. Um, and you can see we're even using bullets if that makes more sense. So if you look under the how you can plan ahead, that section is entirely presented in bullet points. So it's easy to get through, and they thought that that was the most efficient way to display that information. But it is still representative of the organization in question, the Virginia Cooperative Extension. Um, we see the graphic, we see the title, we see the short sentences, we see the use of subheads, we see the various logos. Um, what you can see here is this is a uh, co-sponsored piece, so that's why we have the two logos in the bottom. But at the end of the day, well, uh, some of us may say that this is less attractive. I mean, it's toned down in comparison to the one we've seen previously. This represents the look and feel of the Virginia Cooperative Extension. 
I also want to point out here that this is still organized in a very clean manner. It's easy to figure out if I'm just interested in how do grass channels work. I can figure that out very, very quickly or what a grass channel is. Um, we also have the imagery there as well. So again, these don't have to be very bold pieces if that isn't who our client is. And to be uh, a number one staple of our publicity toolkit. Uh, and oftentimes they go in tandem with the media advisory. Because this is a shortened semester, you're not going to create a media advisory, but we're going to talk about it and I'll show you an example on the next slide. But media advisories, these can go out with a uh, fact sheet. Sometimes they go out along with a press release. But in a lot of ways, it's a very, very short, concise document, as you'll see in a minute, that lets journalists and bloggers know why they should attend an event or be aware of a certain um, a certain situation that's coming up or something that you're hosting as an organization. So some of the things that we're going to see, you'll have the date, a headline, your contact information. We're going to give some background information. Now the five W's and H, the five W's are where, what, when, why, um, and then uh, the H is how. So we won't necessarily be answering all of these, but we want to provide enough information to not only entice journalists and bloggers with the media advisory, but so that they have some working background information. We're going to let them know if interviews are possible and with whom. So if we say our CEO is available for interviews or whoever else in question, um, and if there are any stipulations surrounding that, the timing, uh, certain questions that can or can't be asked. And then a lot of times, too, the background information on the organization. But that's often why we send this along with the fact sheet. So when we have that corporate uh, background or fact sheet, we can send that and allow our media contacts to have access to accurate information that's easy to access. Advisory. Um, I have called out here uh, some of the main components, the advisory elements we just looked at on the previous slide. So we have the logo. So again, this needs to look and feel like the organization in question. We have our W's here in the H. And what I'm going to point out is you don't see all of the W's or the H here because it's not necessarily that they all be represented at the same time. We might decide that it makes more sense, as they did here, to emphasize the what, who, and when. And if our media have questions, we have our contact info there. So if they're looking for the how or the where, for example, uh, which is actually embedded beneath the one, but they can they can access us. We're going to provide that information. Uh, a media advisory is always going to see media advisory on it. You can see in the blue font uh, right to the right of the logo very clearly that this is indicating to the media what this document is. And then again, we're always going to have a headline so that there isn't confusion in terms of what we are attempting to promote. We are going to build to the media kit or publicity toolkit. These are used synonymously. Uh, these used to be handed out in terms of folders. So we would typically give a journalist or blogger, we would email it to them, or if we took them to our organization for a tour to meet them, introduce them to who we are and what we do, we would give them a folder. It would have a press release, some background information, likely your fact sheet. If we had uh, brochures that made sense, any types of photos or bios. What we're doing now, though, in order to save costs and to be more efficient is to either hand out or send out flash drives, but even more commonly is to have a newsroom on our website. We might make this password protected so that journalists or bloggers have to come to us and we'll give them the password so they can access it. So again, if we have um, the headshots and bios of certain members of our staff or they have access to 
our uh, logo or other information that could be manipulated in ways we're not interested in having that done, um, then through the use of the password, we're able to have a little bit more agency in terms of who's using it and when and for what means. But at the end of the day, when we have these media toolkits, it makes it easier for the media to write about us. Right? So if you are trying to do a story and you have access to a photo of someone, you have access to quotes, to the background information, you're more likely to do that story than one where you have to go and figure out how you can access all this information, see if you can call and get quotes in time for a deadline. And not only is that true for the traditional media, but it's also true uh, for individuals who are bloggers now and reaching out to stakeholders in that manner. So, the reason we talk about the fact sheets, the advisories, and the media kits and pitches is, is typically because we have a story, right? We know we have an event coming up or we have a grand opening coming up. We have some sort of newsworthy event or information that we want the media to be made aware of. It's our job as a public relations practitioner to get that information out. Uh, and some of the ways that we do that is through pitching. So before you do any type of pitch, and I talk about here the, the email pitch, telephone pitch, and the Twitter pitch, but before we do any of that, we want to research the, the publication. So that might mean reading the blog post, looking at the comments of the followers, of the blog, it might mean looking at uh, the different, the beat that the journalist writes for a few weeks and seeing what differentiates him or her from other writers, but we need to do our background information, right? We need to do some research in order to figure out who are we reaching out to and what is the content that we're sending them. Um, because the thing is, if we don't customize our pitch, it's going to be unsuccessful. We're going to waste our time. We're going to waste the journalist or the blogger's time. And then after that happens, it becomes very easy for them to block our email. Because they think they haven't done their homework. They don't know who I am and who my stakeholders are. So I'm not even going to look at this. Right? So you're always thinking, how do I answer the so what? So why is this important for this publication or this blog's readers? That's what you need to answer when you're pitching. And then I talked about these three different types of pitches here. How do we figure out what pitch is best for our particular media context? Well, we ask them. We ask them, do you prefer to talk about this? Is it easier to have me on the phone so that you can immediately ask me questions? Um, we could ask them, do you want it in an email so you have it um, in writing in front of you? You have time to think about it and formulate thoughts before you contact me back with questions. Uh, and more recently, a number of journalists and bloggers are asking for tweets. So we know it's limited to 140 characters, and it's a way for them to very quickly and succinctly get through all of the pitches that they receive to decide whether or not the, this particular pitch makes sense for their readers. Uh, one thing I would like you to consider is making sure that you always leave the follow-up in your hands, right? So you have here, always keep the ball in your court. So we don't want to, if we're doing an email pitch, uh, leave it where we say, hope to hear from you, or the same if we leave a voicemail, but rather we're going to be very explicit. We're going to say, if we're sending this pitch on a Monday, say, I'm going to uh, sending you this, I'll follow up with you on Wednesday afternoon in the case that you have any questions or I can provide any additional information. In that sense, you're not sitting and waiting to hear from the media, but you have an active reason and timeline for reaching out to them. That gives you more control in figuring out um, what you want to do right? and your own timeline. So you can make sure that you build in enough time where you can... Uh, line up the interviews if necessary, or collect different imagery or anything else that the journalist or blogger may ask for. <laughs>